This is the day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice and we are glad in it. Greetings, Cascade family and friends. Grace and peace to each of you from God, who is our Father, Jesus the Christ, our Lord, with the power and the presence of Holy Spirit of the Holy Spirit. Welcome to worship. For we know that God has something special in store for each of us today. And so we invite you right now, if you are logged on to social media, to take a moment and share this stream, recognizing when you do so, so many other people are blessed. And if you are here gathered in the Cascade Sanctuary, we welcome you to in-person worship. We believe God has something amazing prepared and in store for us today. So let us prepare our hearts now for worship as we go before the throne to worship the truth and the living God. Welcome to worship.
You can do better than that. Yeah. God bless you this week. As he kept you this week. Are you able to stand right here and worship and give the praise for the blessing seen and unseen? Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard what God has in store for us. And I just want to take a time and a moment just to give God praise, not just for what he's done, but for what he will do. Not just for who he is, but for who he has been. For his faithfulness, for his steadfast love, for his unyielding mercy and love towards us. And we want to thank you right now in the name of Jesus yes. for joining us in to worship this morning. And whether you're worshiping with us here online or in person, we want you to center yourselves for an incredible move of God in this space. As we remain standing this morning, we now would like to invite the light of Christ. Amen. Can we give our acolytes another round of applause? And as you remain standing, let us go to God in prayer this morning. Holy Spirit, this morning we ask you to come sit right where we are. Father, we're in need of you this morning. Father, you told us in your word that where there are two or three in your name, that you would also be there with us. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you interrogate our hearts and elevate our minds. We ask that you meet the needs of the people who have come in your name today. Move, Holy Spirit, like you never have before. And in Jesus' name, bless us so that we can continue to be a blessing to this world. Bless us during the service and allow your word to penetrate our hearts so we can live more like you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated.
Well, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I don't know about you, but I was just glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Can we give God praise for God's goodness and God's mercy in our lives? Come on, enter into God's gates with thanksgiving and into God's courts with praise. Be thankful unto God. Somebody ought to bless his name, for the Lord is still good. His mercies are everlasting. Somebody just sing that oh. Come on, collectively, let's say oh. Sometimes you don't know what to pray for. And you got to just say oh. I like that. Say that again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Friends, good morning, family, grace and peace to each of you. from God, who is indeed our father, Jesus, the Christ, our Lord, with the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit. I'm so glad that I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Your mind could be on a whole lot of things. But when you have your mind fixed on Jesus, come what may. You come to worship the true and the living God. And so that's why we worship together today. We welcome each of you who are here in person with us to Cascade and to each of you who are worshiping with us online. It is our great joy and delight each week to welcome you in the grace and the peace of God who loves us unconditionally. It is a very special day in the life of our church as we have the great honor and privilege of welcoming one who is a voice for this generation social justice and activism we give god praise as we welcome to this house none other than bishop william barber the second cascade can we welcome him in the joy of the lord today <laughs> sir we honor you we honor the great work continue to pray God's blessings upon you and your travels. We thank God for Reverend Alvin Jackson who was able to coordinate this. Can we give God praise for Reverend Jackson? Where is Reverend Jackson? I know he's up here somewhere. Hey, man, we bless God for him. Hey, brother, so grateful for you and for making sure Rev got here safely so we can prepare to hear a word from the Lord today. Family, we give God thanks for a wonderful fall festival open house on yesterday for each of you who came out. Amen. Thank you so much to all of our volunteers. Our kids had an amazing time uh, for your effort for that. We give God thanks. We also want to lift up just a couple of announcements. Um, one, we will have a Southwest Atlanta Neighborly Community Health Fair that will be hosted at Jean Childs Young Middle School. Our own Terrera Hill is helping to organize that. It will be on November the 2nd. 10 a.m. to 2 o'clock p.m. We want to make sure that our community is aware of that so that we can spread the word for anyone who wants to attend this very important community health fair. Also, at our Midtown campus on November the 2nd and the 9th, we will have uh, two nights of prayer as we prepare our hearts to move uh, into this new season of expansion for our ministry. At 6.30 p.m., we will be led in prayer by our clergy and also our laity will be involved. We want you to be there November the 2nd uh, in the Cascade Midtown Sanctuary and also on the 9th. Also, you will note that on next Sunday, we will celebrate All Saints Sunday. This is our opportunity to light a candle in remembrance of all of those who have gone on to glory this year. It's a very high and holy day in the life of our church, and so we want you to be here on site, in person if you can, or please watch online. Let us continue to lift those families up in our midst who continue to grieve the loss of a loved one. Also, you know that uh, the new Black Panther movie is on the way. It's coming out. Somebody just say Wakanda forever. Wakanda forever. Uh, we we want to make sure that we support this, uh, this franchise of film. We give God thanks because Marvel got it right with this one. And so we're excited to announce that next month, Saturday, November 19th, we are taking over a movie theater. And at 3 o'clock p.m., we will be holding an event called Cascade Movie Day. 
And this will be a day where we will go to a movie theater together as a church to see the new Black Panther movie, Wakanda Forever. This is going to be an exciting, fun time for all of us. And so this event is open to all of our members, especially our youth and our young adults. But anyone can come. And so we just need you uh, to register. Uh, please go to our young people's division at cascadeumc.org if you are interested in attending. You will also see this come out in Pathway uh, this week. We want to make sure that we support this wonderful film. Um, also, I want to uh, let you know that our beloved director of music, Karen Lauer, she did give me permission to share this with you. Uh, we want to keep Karen lifted in, her, in our prayers as um, she is going to be absent for a few weeks as she's heading in for knee replacement surgery. And so we want to pray for our sister. Karen, let you know, we want to let you know that we love you. We are praying for you. Uh, and in Karen's absence, we are so grateful that our own Kenny Banks will be offering interim leadership uh, as our director of music and worship arts in her absence. Can we give God praise for Karen and Kenny and just their collaboration? Thank you, my brother. Today, we also um, want to stand uh, in the space of prayer uh, for a church that's very well known uh, to Cascade and a church with whom we partnered through the years, uh, the Abyssinian Baptist Church uh, in New York. We know that um, they lost their beloved pastor of so many decades, Reverend, Calvin, Reverend Dr. Calvin Butts. And so uh, we want to continue to pray for that family. Uh, we know that um, Dr. Butts had many connections within Cascade. Uh, Roy Johnson was best friends, who was our finance chair. Um, he, he and Calvin were, Dr. Butts were best friends for over 50 years. He's grieving today. We know that each year when I'm blessed to go and preach on the vineyard, the third Sunday um, used to be Dr. Butts' Sunday. And the fact that I can stand in that place um, to proclaim where he once did is, uh, is a blessing. And so let us continue to keep um, that church lifted in our prayers. Uh, also, uh, it is with a heavy heart uh, this morning that, that I share some news for our church that uh, we invite you to keep... Uh, Janice Walters and family uh, in prayer as we learned just this morning, our beloved member uh, David Walters transitioned to glory on last night. Uh, and so um, the irony is Dave was just here on yesterday morning in an ushers meeting uh, with our men's usher board. And uh, we know who Dave is. Dave is a larger than life man. <laughs> he uh, walks our cross in every first Sunday. Um, and we want to just continue to keep Janice and the family uh, in our prayers. This is a heavy loss for our church. Um, and Can we pray this morning? I just want to pray for his family. I want to pray for our, our men who have been grieving this morning. Uh, we are a church. And... We feel the weight of loss uh, today. And so, God, we pray to the God of our weary years, oh, the God of our silent tears, the one who is still bringing us thus far along the way. God, we just stand in agreement right now that in the midst of death, you are still God. You told us in your word, oh, death, where is your victory? death where is your sting lord we pray right now in the name of jesus that you would comfort or oh comfort the walters family we pray lord for sister janice that you would be her strength we pray oh god that for all of those who had the great joy and privilege of knowing brother dave that you would give us the strength and comfort in the days ahead as we plan his celebration of life experience as we offer comfort to his family pray oh god that you would be our strength lord i pray for our men ushers this morning pray god that you would comfort them at their very point of need lord they've lost a giant among them a servant and i pray lord that you would give them what they need in this moment so be our guide and be our strength for it is in the name of jesus who is the christ that we pray and all who love the lord said amen and amen. Family, we give God praise again, for we know that God is still in our midst and we will worship our God, spirit and in truth. Let us prepare our hearts now to give unto the Lord.
As we continue in worship, we know that giving is a very important part of worship. Our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness are all the ways that we serve the Lord God and the church. And we are so grateful for all of our Cascade members who give so much, who sacrifice so much, that we can be the church that God is calling us to be. So as we come this morning, we thank God there are so many opportunities and so many ways that you can give, and they will be on the screen. But if you're here with us, serving in a sanctuary this morning, that we know that in the Grand Hall, there are many receptacles where you can leave your tithes and your offering. We're always accepting those that come through the mail at 3144 Cascade Road. Let us pray. Holy and righteous God, giving and loving God, you gave through your son, Jesus Christ, and you call us to follow you, Lord, in that manner. Lord, the gifts that we offer today are just a small token of affirmation that we accept that we will follow Christ. We will follow your love. We will follow your generosity, your compassion, and your forgiveness. And we thank you for your grace. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. And all who love the Lord will say amen, amen, and amen. I know it's prayer time. And it's time that we go before God and race to the throne of God tell God about our troubles. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. It's the time that we slow down and tell God what we need. And as we gather this morning, we heard of the loss of Brother Walters and his family. We're moved this morning by the tragic attack on the husband of speaker Nancy Pelosi in her home. We're moved by the tragedy that happened at a Halloween event in Seoul, South Korea, where at least 150, 153 people are dead. We're not even slowing down long enough to remember all the tragedies that are happening on the streets of Atlanta, Georgia. And as we gather in this room, the Bible says it this way, that if you are in trouble, you should pray. And if everything is well, you should be saying hallelujah, thank you Jesus, or something. If you're sick, call for the elders of the church that they may lay hands on you and pray in the anointing of the Lord. And if you've committed any sins, they'll be forgiven of you. And I know we can't come to the sacred altar here today, but if you are here today and desire special prayer this morning that we might stand in agreement with you, I invite you in your own sacred space to stand where you are or find that place that we might pray with you this morning as we engage the throne of God. Lord, you said in your word to call to you and you will answer us. And you will show us great and mighty things which we've never seen before. You said in your word that you would never leave us nor forsake us, O oh God. In another place, your scripture reminds us that you are our helper and mortal man can't do anything to us. So with that rejoicing faith today, we come into your presence as people of God with hearts that have been broken, hearts that are hurting, hearts that are in pain. And yes, some in this room are just coming before your presence with hearts of thanksgiving. Thanking you that we are able to dress ourselves, clothe ourselves, move ourselves, and that we are not on the streets today. We come into your presence today as people of God from all of our trials, all of our tribulations, coming boldly before your throne that we might obtain the grace and the mercy to help us in this time of need. And as our forefathers said before, if we ever needed the Lord, we sure do need him now. Lord, we need you to come into our homes and into our lives and into our families. 
those who are sick oh God I pray that you will reach out a hand of healing and those who are struggling oh God grant them peace today in the name of Jesus I pray God for those who are lost, grieving the loss of loved ones today that you will be a source of comfort to them Lord we lift up our country and our nation today because you said in your word that if your people who are called by your name would humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from their wicked ways, you would hear from heaven, forgive our sins and heal our land. God, we pray for healing today. Lord, we want healing all over the land and country today. And Lord, as we prepare now to hear a fresh word from you, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will strengthen the preacher, that you will bless him, O oh God, that you fulfill him with your wisdom, your power, and your anointing. And at the same time, saturate our hearts and our minds and our spirits that we may hear a word from you. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, put your hand together. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord if you believe. Come on, bless his name if you believe in the power of that prayer. Amen.
Oh, can you say it? Can you declare yes, it? I will trust you, Lord. Oh, can you proclaim that? Can you say, yes, I will, yes, I will, yes, I will, yes, I will. Yes, I will trust you, Lord. Trust you, Lord. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Yes, I will trust you, Lord. Yes, I will trust you, Lord. Oh, 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 I will, I will trust. trust. I will, I will, I will trust. I'll put my trust in you, Lord. Oh, 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 oh. Every day, in the new morning, each mercy I see, I'm gonna declare and proclaim that I will trust. When I get down in my spirit, I'll say, Oh, I will, I will trust. When I don't understand, I'm gonna trust. Can't see my way through. I will trust. Yes, I will. Yes, I will, Lord. Oh, I will. Me not to my own, not to my own, not to my own understanding. You know what's better for me. I will trust. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. I will trust every day, every day. Oh, my ways, God, are not your ways. My thoughts, oh God, are not your thoughts. You love me, Jesus. Yes, I will. Yes, I will trust you, Lord. Oh, I'm glad that all things work together for me. Oh, Lord, that's why I know I can trust you. Yes, yes I will trust, trust you, Lord. people of God said amen. amen. Family, I have the distinct honor to introduce unto you our guest speaker for today. Bishop William J. Barber II is the president and senior lecturer of Repairers of the Breach. He is co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Our speaker today is also the architect of the moral movement which began with weekly moral Monday protests 
at the North Carolina General Assembly in 2013. And recently relaunched again in August 2020 under the banner of the Poor People's Campaign. In 2018, Bishop Barber helped relaunch the Poor People's Campaign, which was begun by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in 1968, starting with a historic wave of protest in state capitals and a moral budget to address the five interlocking injustices of systemic racism, systemic poverty, the war economy and militarism, ecological devastation, and denial of health care, and the false moral narrative of Christian nationalism. There are currently 45 state coordinating committees across the country that are mobilizing around the Poor People's Jubilee platform and the We Must Do More, M-O-R-E. Mobilize, organize, register, and educate people for a movement that votes. How many of you all know voting is critical? We need to vote like our lives depend on it. Bishop Barber is a highly sought after speaker. He has given the keynote address at hundreds of national and state conferences, including the 2016 Democratic National Convention. On January 21st, 2001, he delivered the homily for the 59th inaugural prayer service for President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. And has spoken in renowned venues such as the Vatican and the 5th UNI Global Union World Congress to more than 25 countries. He's a former Mel King Fellow at MIT. He is currently visiting Professor of Public Theology and Activism at Union Theological Seminary and is a Senior Fellow at Auburn Seminary. Mr. Barber is regularly featured in media outlets such as MSNBC, CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, The Nation Magazine, among others. Mr. Barber was named one of, 20, one of the 2020 BET 100 Entertainers and Innovators. And as a social justice warrior, he is one of the 2019 recipients of the North Carolina Award, the state's highest civilian honor. He is a 2018 MacArthur Foundation Genius Award recipient as well as a 2015 recipient of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Four Freedoms Award. Reverend Dr. Barber has had 10 honorary degrees conferred upon him. That is a snippet of his bio. What I can tell you is I have admired his witness for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have admired as we all have, how he has stood with boldness and courage and authority in the midst of a world filled with systemic oppression. He is still a voice for this generation. And church family, I am so glad that we have welcomed him to this place called Cascades United Methodist Church. He is going to my hometown of Jackson, Mississippi on tomorrow just to get into a little bit of good trouble. Bishop Barber, we are praying for you. But at this moment, before we welcome him to proclaim what thus says the Lord, we want to invite Miss Yara Allen, a psalmist, to come and lead us in one of the great freedom songs. But Cascade, at this time, I invite you to join me in welcoming our guest preacher for today, none other than Bishop William J. Barber II. Can we welcome him in the joy of the Lord? Lives begin to end the day that we become silent about things that matter. And we're on our way, those of us who have not already gone to the polls are on our way, right? So there's a song that has become the mantra, one of the mantras of our movement. And the song says, somebody's hurting my brother, my sister, my family. 
Somebody's hurting the children. Somebody's poisoning the water. And it's gone on far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I, I realize that it's Sunday morning. There's a beautiful choir behind me, and there's a beautiful choir in front of me. And I'm going to ask that you all would stand. And in the movement, we, we try to stand and sing together. And we say that we stand together because we stand together. Right? And I know that you're masked, but if you would just give this song some energy. Musicians, I know you can pick it up. You all are excellent. And so the song says, in the tradition of, of Dr. Bernice King, we're going to grow this song. Right? And we're going to bring all of the people that we're voting for, that, that whose names and situations are on the ballot, we're going to bring them into the room. Those who can't be here, those people who we know are impacted, we're going to sing this for them. And the words are simply, somebody's hurting my brother and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. It's gone on. Somebody's hurting my brother and it's gone on. And then we'll all simply say, and we won't be silent anymore. All right? <clears throat> so I'll start, and we're going to grow it. Oh, somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. I tell you, it's gone on far too long. Oh, somebody's hurting my brother. And it's gone on far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. You feel it growing? Did you hear somebody's hurting my sister? And it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on. And it's gone on. Yes, it's gone on. I tell you, it's gone on. Oh, somebody's poisoning the water. And it's gone on. Yes, it has. And we won't be silent anymore.
Let's give it up for Miss Yara Allen. Let's give it up for the Cascade Jump Off Choir, all of you. Justice Jump Off Choir. Let's give it up for your pastor, amen. Brother Muriel, Dr. Muriel, we thank God for him. And, and let's give it up for Jesus. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus. Power of the Spirit. And that no matter what, our Father watches over us. Lord, we thank you this morning for your grace and your mercy. We know that whenever you call men and women to preach, you take the risk of putting treasure in trash, treasure in an earthen vessel, sometimes faithful, sometimes flawed, sometimes up, sometimes down, but you do it that the excellency of the power might be of thee and not of us. So hide us behind the cross, cover us in your blood, fill us with your spirit, that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart might be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and blessed Redeemer, come Holy Spirit, come with preaching, hearing, and teaching power. In Jesus' name, amen. I am honored and humbled to stand in this historic and living pulpit today when I got a call from the Reverend Dr. Alvin Jackson who's a Mississippian like your pastor. Dr. Jackson, former pastor of, of um, many churches in this society, Mississippi Boulevard in Tennessee, one of them, and said that Pastor Mariel was open to us coming. Uh, it did my heart some kind of good. But you know what really did my heart good? And I've already been richly blessed this morning. Uh, to see your pastor call a name of a member and then weep. Uh, you got a real pastor. I said y'all got a real pastor. I've been trying to pastor now some 34 years. And I've gone and seen places where folk get into routine. And they treat people like they're on an assembly line. And they lose the emotion and the touch. But when you have a pastor that still can weep openly and care for the sheep and the members, that's something marvelous to see. And it is a sign of the spirit among you. And I'm so honored that I could see that today in this, this pastor. And we pray for the family. Now, I come here this morning at the end of a campaign where on June, on June 18th, uh, Dr. Jackson being our executive director, we called for the mass poor people's low wage workers assembly moral march on Washington and to the polls. And more than 150,000 people showed up and some three million initially online. On that day, impacted people from Alabama to Appalachia, from Kentucky to Kansas, from Georgia uh, to North Carolina, told their nation their stories and their Im how they were impacted, how they represented the 140 million people in this country today who are poor and low wealth. But then they all declared we won't be silent anymore. And they said we will leave this place and we will go and turn out the vote in a massive way because we will not be unseen or unheard. We launched a campaign from there to touch five million low income, poor and low wealth voters of every race, creed and color. Uh, to touch them, to encourage them, to move them. I come here this morning to preach a national sermon. This sermon is being cross-posted in more than 200 sites that can reach more than 10 million people. Uh, it's being cross-posted to 40-some state coordinating committees. 
And I come here to announce that today we have reached 5.1 million poor and low income voters, low propensity voters who represent the sleeping giant in this nation. It will either do a lot of things now or it will do a lot of things in the days to come. But we know that it is time for the stones that have been rejected to become the chief cornerstones of a new reality in America. And this is the Lord's doing. And so I want to ask you this morning, I, I didn't come with a bumper sticker sermon this morning. I want to ask you to settle in with me for a minute as we try to make sense of this moment by way of the spirit and the scriptures. A reporter asked me, how can you preach uh, and not sound partisan? I said, because I'm preaching Jesus. What's wrong with you? I'm preaching the politics of God, the word of God. And so this Sunday, when the church begins to think about this whole week, all saints season, remembering the living who are living in the spirit, who died in the flesh. And we come to the Sunday almost before the last Sunday, before the election season in these United States, when we will elect half of the Senate, all of the United States House of Representatives, governors, city council people, and county commissioners, and others all across this country. I want to try to lift up a story from the gospel and a line from the Hebrews, letter to the Hebrews, to preach in this particular zitz and laban, this particular setting both of the text and setting of history. And I'm not unmindful that your pastor is a preacher's preacher having finished at Jackson State and Emory and Duke University and he's filled with the spirit. And so I know that he does not want eisegesis, he wants exegesis. John the fifth chapter declares, and if you want to stand, it's fine, of the gospel. In the fifth verse, sometimes later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate, a pool which is Aramaic is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades, porches. Here, a great number of sick people, disabled people, used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in the condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to be made whole? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Jesus then said, get up, pick up your bat mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walk. And then from the 10th chapter, the letter of Hebrews, one scripture that your former pastor, Dr. Lowry, Dr. King and others used to quote in the hard times of the movement. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39. But we are not of those who shrink back unto destruction. We are those who persevere unto the salvation of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. 
This morning, I want to try to walk and teach for a moment. We know what we must do and why we must do it now. Look at somebody with your mask still on and say, we know what we must do and why we must do it now. And somebody shout, voting. In our gospel text, Jesus comes to this place of pain and misery. And it is a place where people are suffering who could not get help people who felt like their political leaders didn't care, their religious leaders didn't care, and sometimes even their fellow sufferers didn't care. Here again, the cry of the man, I have no one to help me in the pool. It is a place for those who know Uh, that nothing is being done to reduce the misery index. And the Bible says that Jesus went there. That Jesus went where the misery index was high and the mercy index could hardly be measured. And yet, what a strange question Jesus asked. Do you want to be made whole? Here's a brother who's been in this situation for 38 years and he's sitting with all the folk who feel rejected. His body is weak. The smell of the sickness is all on him and it radiates and ruminates throughout the five porches. Here he is just hoping that somehow this water will heal him for he had been told that once a year an angel would come by and stir the water. And yet Jesus asked him, do you want to be made whole? It almost seems that Jesus is saying to the man, you know what he, the man, he knew what needed to do, but he was not acting on it. Some say that this was a harsh word. But really, in the moment about transformation, I think that's what's really going on here. That this is a moment about transformation and how people have to come to a point where they are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Now, people have to come to a point where they decide to do what they must do with what they have to change the situation and the conditions around him. The answer from the man is, I don't have anybody to show me how. But Jesus refuses to accept it because Jesus knew what the man could do for himself. And Jesus knew what he could do for him if he would only do his part. It is interesting that in this text, the man complains about what he doesn't have But Jesus, I believe, and I believe Jesus believed in what I like to call the inch-by-inch ministry. Uh, Jesus knew that this man could have inched himself a little closer to the water's edge every day for 365 days. And by the time the angel who traveled to the water came, the man could have cast his vote to be healed and fell over in the water. Jesus is trying to show the man the power that he has and what he must do with the power. The man then explains that he has nobody, again, to throw him in. But Jesus also believes in the pulling together ministry. That it's not just what you can do inch by inch, but what we can do when we all join together. Truth of the matter is, What if, in spite of all the misery and all the pain uh, that existed by the pool because of all the bad policies of Caesar, because of all the hatefulness of that time toward the least of these that Cicero once called the dregs of the city, 
What if despite everything that told this man he really didn't matter, uh, what if all of the misery had decided to turn their misery into a movement? What if the whole group had decided, you grab my arm and I'll grab your arm because we ain't going to leave nobody behind? And what if they had pulled themselves, each one of them, over to the edge of the well? And then when the angel came once a year, they could have all voted to fall over in the water together and be healed. But they had done none of that. So Jesus says to this man, if you want to be whole, begin to act as though you don't have to accept this level of misery. Act as though you do not have to accept this level of pain. Act as though you don't have to accept this level of oppression, this level of abandonment, this level of hopelessness. Instead, stay focused on transformational change. You can be made whole. You don't have to wait to vote next year. You can vote right now. You can organize your mind right now. You can organize your attitude right now. You can decide that this porch, this situation, these conditions, the realities in this America don't have to be like this. You can do something if you'll just take a vote, either inch by inch or as a group. You don't have to stay here. You know who you are and you know what to do and you know why you have to do it. You can go out and do it right where you are in the midst of everything else that's going on. You can decide to go in another direction. Jesus is saying you've been living here for now about a generation. And you may not know it, but over this period of time, God has given you a certain level of power. You actually have the power within you to organize this misery into a powerful group that refuses to accept things the way they are. There were people then saying, leave them alone. Don't give them health care. Don't provide basic essentials of human rights. But Jesus says that the people in the place of misery don't have to accept the misery that's being placed on you. They can change it by their actions. They can vote for things to be different. They can organize their mat and get up. They are not just people to be acted upon just because you're poor and laying at by the pool of Bethsaida. It doesn't mean you don't have power. Your actions could have an impact all over. I hear Jesus saying, make a decision. Don't just allow what's going on to be acted upon you. Choose your actions and make them. You know what you have to do and you know why you must do it. It's in you. And now is the season that you must stand up and refuse with your voice and your vote and your actions to accept this misery anymore. And it may not be the whole pool. But if you move, it could impact the entire pool situation, the entire nation. All God requires for you is to stand up and act like you ought not be here. Our second text comes from Hebrews. Hebrews was originally a letter to the scattered people who suffered under the imperial leadership of Emperor Claudius. These Christians, like their ancestors in Egypt, knew that the outburst of evil rulers could always make their life more difficult. Touch your neighbor COVID safe and say, we've always had evil rulers. Why are you so surprised? (laughs) We've always had those who had forced us to have to struggle for against injustice. Now, these scattered Hebrews, they were the people of the diaspora, i.e., like us. They had embraced Jesus' movement of revolutionary love and truth and justice, and they had seen some significant victories 
They knew the power of the resurrection, but they were still facing death, persecution, and, uh, and, 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 and its attempt to break their spirit. This, we must remember, is the pattern of oppression. This is the pattern of fascism, to lie and break your spirit. It's been a pattern throughout human history, and it is relentless. It always aims to make us shrink back bow down and stop resisting injustice and it always attempts to make us turn our religion into a place of quarantine where we hide rather than an army from which we fight. Oppression is real and it can be destructive but in Hebrews 10 the writer says the greater destruction is when we forget who we are and we shrink back and go backwards. Properly defining oneself and one's nature and one's calling is a critical philosophical theological discipline that has penetrating and practical implication, particularly when you're in crisis. You must know who you are, you must know what you have, and you must know what, when it's time to use it. When you're facing seasons of challenge and confronting threats, the threat ultimately will seek to take your identity and redefine who you are. And we can never let oppressive forces or mean and authoritative leaders define who we are and what we do. Knowing who you are is critical to your sanity, politically and emotionally. It is critical to your ability to sustain a fight when you're facing what Paul Tillich called the very threat of non-being and non-existence. It is true for individuals. It is true for communities. It is true for nations. Now, to be sure, my brothers and sisters, we have always, not just black people, but we have always had to fight to maintain a proper sense of self because America has always struggled with schizophrenia. America has always struggled with knowing who she is and who she wants to be. America, whom I love, uh, has always, though, had a kind of split personality. At times, political and social schizophrenia diagnosed and undiagnosed. A great gulf between what she dreams to be and what she is in reality. What she says on paper and what she does in practice. No wonder one of the great national hymns had to finally admit and pray, America, America, God, mend thine every flaw. America has always had competing dualities. If we do not face this reality, we can never come to terms with who we really are. The original audience to this letter to Hebrews was a community of people who wondered if they were ever going to make it out of oppression. It it actually looked like Claudius and these other crazy Caesars. And you know who Caesar was. Caesar was a guy who loved to put his name on buildings. who always tried to control the Senate, who lied at every term, and who believed he ought to have a lifetime right to rulership. I'm talking about Caesar. Might I I suggest that Caesar, or at least the Caesar spirit, still lives. And for these Hebrews, it looked like this nonviolent group of people, their authoritarian leaders had the power and they had an, a, a, an entire complement of enablers because Caesar really ain't the problem. It's all of the enablers of Caesar. Yeah. 
They struggled, these folk in the Hebrews, to hold on to hope. Sometimes they got down and depressed. They thought about going back. Uh, they, they got depressed about the world around them. And at their very worst moments, they were attempted to believe that Caesar Claudius and Caesar Nero and Caesar, I mean, Caesar Claudius and Caesar Nero were as strong as they pretended to be when they boasted in their power and basked in their pride. In other words, the, the, the Christians in the book letter to the Hebrew almost started believing the hype but somebody like Paul would write and say remember we are not of those who shrink back unto destruction but we are those who have faith and are saved both of these biblical texts, Pastor, uh, tell us there are times when we know what we must do and why we must do it. Now, I know someone's listening today who is tired of the lies, who is weary of injustice, who longs for a day when it might be a little easier to make ends meet. People who are sick of people saying things like, well, it's not as bad as Jim Crow and segregation. Like, that ain't even a conversation worth having, especially when the data says, I know, I know we have some serious problems. And the issue is not, is it as bad as segregation? The issue is, if we fought and won segregation, why in the hell is it still so bad today? That's the real issue. My almost 90-year-old mama cried on my shoulder one day and said, boy, when I had you on August 30th, 1963, two days after the march on Washington, I never imagined that my son would have to get arrested 17 times fighting some of the same mess that I fought. The issue is not, is it as bad as segregation was and have things gotten a little better? The issue is, in, considering all we've already been through, why are some things still alive so much today? Some folks say, we've never seen anything like this before, but we know that's not true. I mean, that's a cursory reading of history. You do remember that they burnt the capital down in the 1800s. You do remember Tulsa, right, and Wilmington, North Carolina, that insurrections are not new. Do you do remember that white supremacy in the highest office of the land is not some new thing? It's not just something that just came along because of a particular personality. You do know that uh, Woodrow Wilson played Birth of a Nation in the Oval Office in 1914, 15, and 16 and told his staff that the glorification of the Klan was the kind of history that America needed. And that Woodrow Wilson also lied about a pandemic. Woodrow Wilson also tried to blame another people, the Spanish people, for the pandemic. Woodrow Wilson also did not do what needed to be done, and 600,000 people died. And that was 100 years ago. So my brothers and sisters, please tell folk to stop saying we've never seen what we see in today. The fact of the matter is we've seen it, and that's the problem, that we didn't learn the lessons when we saw it before and now like Goliath's cousin it has risen up again without a doubt we are a nation in crisis but we must be aware of the urge to act as though we don't know what to do in every age we know what to do tell the truth turn on your tenacity and take action we know what to do. There is spiritual sickness that has not been cleansed from the veins of this democracy. You can see it in the combination of five 
interlocking injustices, systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And by systemic racism, I mean the racism that affects black people, brown people, Asian people, indigenous people, and even has collateral damage on white people. Ra systemic racism, I'm not talking about somebody calling you the N-word, I'm talking about somebody passing policies that have a disparate impact on your community while they smile at you all the way. We can see it, and it still produces extremism in the State House, in the Congress, in the courts, in the White House, in the DA offices, in the AG offices, and police departments. Princeton historian Neil Painter has said that what we see now is not a person but the entire cohort of extremism. It is symptomatic of an often recovering, recurring iconography in the American story. We come to our senses as a nation for a moment, and then we have a massive mean and regressive relapse. No one person, no one president, not one party. Remember, Martin Luther King taught us that extremists and moderates were both enemies of progress that extremists and moderates were both enemies of progress. Uh, one president did not create the divisions we see today. They may have exploited them in a plan of pol positive polarization that was begun by the Southern strategy 50 years ago. There was a plan put in place in the 1960s and they said if they did it, it would last for more than 60 years. The first time we saw this, can I teach for a moment, was in the bourbon class. Dr. King talked about it when he at the steps of the Montgomery, of the Alabama State House at the end of the summer of the Montgomery March. He said the bourbon class used tactics in the South after the Civil War and in the midst of the great race class progress they saw. They saw black and white people coming together in the 1800s after slavery as a threat. They declared that they wanted their country back. And King taught us that at the end of the Selma to Mount Montgomery, he said, listen, toward the end of the Reconstruction era, something very significant happened. They began uniting Negroes and white masses into a voting bloc made up of people that threatened to drive the southern racist aristocracy out of its command post in the south and in the country. And to meet this threat, the southern aristocracy began immediately to engineer a segregated society. So segregated society and division and turning people against one another was a reaction to the fear of the restructuring of America's economic architecture by black and white people in a way that would help everybody. And so they didn't want everybody help, they wanted their country. So they sold division, they worked to control mass media and the courts, they revised the doctrine of white supremacy, they saturated the thinking of the poor white masses with it, and thus they clouded their minds to the real issues in order to stop the populist reconstruction movement of the 19th century. <sighs> Afraid of this movement? that rich, the rich southern aristocracy also gave us the southern strategy. This strategy was developed as an ideology, it was a plan that was hatched in 1967, just before Dr. King was killed. You got to know this history to understand the moment we're in. You got to know why this man was in misery 38 years. Phillips, Kevin Phillips advised Richard Nixon that his party could win without the Negro vote, but he had to paint the other party as the black party. Philip went on to say, the only way we can win is we must engage in positive polarization. We must intentionally split the nation. We must use racialized code words to split the nation. And Buchanan said, if we split the nation, then we can, we'll win the better half. He said it might go out of control, but it's worth the risk if we want the power. In a book by Jonathan Shell in, in 1976, he called it a time of illusion. He said their goal was to cut the parties in, and the country in half. And then when they used the an animosity against the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the labor movement, and the peace movement, 
to split the country, they said, if we ever get caught, disavow it publicly. So we can't say we've never seen this before. What we are seeing is rooted in struggles. It's rooted in struggles as old as the biblical prophets against the false prophets, as old as Jesus versus the Pharisee, as old as the slave master religion versus the religion of Jesus, as old as the social gospel movement versus the religion of nationalism, as old as the prosperity gospel versus the labor movement versus corporate greed versus the civil rights organization versus the white citizens council. Yes, we have seen it before in different forms, but we have seen it before. Remember how Dr. King and Rosa Parks experienced more violence after they won in Montgomery. Remember when Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed, a veteran for trying to vote? At his eulogy, Martin Luther King said some things that made people upset, but he was trying to tell folk, don't treat this too weak, to understand the complexities. He said at Jimmy Lee Jackson's funeral, who murdered Jimmy Lee Jackson? He said, every white lawman who abuses the law to terrorize us, every white politician who feeds on prejudice and hatred, every white preacher who preaches the Bible and stays silent before his white congregation, who murdered Jimmy Lee Jackson, every black preacher who will not get involved in the movement for Joseph Justice, who murdered Jimmy Lee Jackson, every Negro man and Negro woman who stands by without joining this fight as their brothers and sisters are brutalized, humiliated, and ripped from the earth. The question is not just who, but what killed, and it's complex. So we can't get to the root of today's assault on democracy without getting beyond the personality of just one person. The tactics we are seeing today have their roots in the states' right movement that began before the Civil War. The Confederates militarized it. The KKK made, gave it violence. Plessy versus Ferguson legalized it. It was picked up and continued by Strom Thurmond, Barry Goldwater, George Wallace. It became a political Southern strategy. It was developed by Kevin Phillips and Lee Atwater. It was picked up by others and continued by Pat Buchanan. And the latest one just charismatized it and pushed it with media savvy and got billions of folk to invest in it as long as they got their tax cuts. But whatever this moment is, it is not a moment that we don't know what to do and why we must do it. Last week, I sat with a circle of elders and young leaders in the movement, black, Latino, male, female, white, gay, straight, young, old, different faiths. As we talked, it became clear. Here are some things we know. Can you pray with me just a little while? Number one, we know what we're supposed to be. We are human beings made in the image of God who are supposed to care about our brothers and sisters and anything, any policy that robs that, we have to challenge it. We are supposed to be people who know some things self-evidently that all persons are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, living in the pursuit of happiness. We know what we believe no matter how many lies we have heard Justice, fundamental fairness, love, and truth are more important than lies and greed and meanness. And we know in the 21st century that racism and economic fear still too often conjure a powerful magic which compels this nation to seek safety in hating the other and security in a false nativism and nationalism that has failed us before and will fail us again. And those of us who know what it looks like and smells like, even when some of the folk that look like us are selling us out, we still know that we've got to challenge these five interlocking injustices, systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, slash the denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And there are some other things we know. And I'm going to say some things now, and every one of these things are the result of policies and the result of whose vote put who in office. Right now in this country, we have 140 million people living in poverty and low wealth. 60.9% of all black people. 
26 million people, 30% of all white people, 66 million people. Right now in this country, 55 million people work without a living wage. They work without a living wage. Right in this country right now, 87 million people are uninsured or underinsured. In this country right now, 400 families make an average of $97,000 an hour while we get locked up fighting for $15. Yeah. In this country right now, 4 million families get up every day and can buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water. Right now in this country, 1 million people have died and increasing from COVID. 330,000 died because they didn't have health care, didn't have anything to do with COVID. And poor and low wealth people died at a rate two to five times higher from COVID, not because COVID killed them, but because the deliveries of services discriminated against them. We know that 6 to 8% of all the COVID money went to corporations rather than to the people and the essential workers. We know that, we, that, that certain forces change people's names from service workers to essential workers because by calling them essential workers, it meant they had to go to work. But we sent them to work without health care, without a living wage, without paid family leave. And they were the first to get sick, the first to die. We know. We know that during this period of time, billionaires have made $2 trillion while millions more people have fallen into poverty. We know this. We know that the real cost of maintaining this unequal economy is atrocious. We lose $1 trillion to child poverty every year. It cost us $2.6 trillion in lost earnings from gender and wage gaps, we, race or wage gaps. We lost, we've lost $1.3 trillion in government revenue by lowering the corporate tax rate, thereby disabling the government to do what the government ought to do insofar as caring for the least of these and lifting up the society. By 2017, we spent $6.4 trillion in endless wars, in action, and some say over $21 trillion since the start of the war in Afghanistan, in action on climate change may cost us $3.3 trillion annually. The economic and social cost of poverty is high. Unstable housing among families with children will cost us $111 billion in avoidable health and special education costs. The porch is not full of misery because the people want to be in misery. The porch is full of misery because of the bad public policy of those who sit in office. All of this division and racism, this is what it gets you. Hunger cost $160 billion a year in increased health care costs and another $18 billion to poor educational outcomes because you can't learn when, you, when you're hungry. Public assistance programs spend $153 billion a year because corporations won't pay people a living wage. Mass incarceration costs $179 billion a year for policing, courts, and private operations, and another $87 billion in lost opportunities after being incarcerated. Our immigration system, broken, cost us $123 billion in lost contribution. Our current health care system cost us $1.69 trillion on private insurances because we, as America, are the only of the 25 wealthiest countries that ties people's health care to their job and not their humanity. The porch is full of misery. The minimum wage is $7.25. In Georgia, $5.15. And when you go out this evening to the restaurant, the people who wait on you make $2.13 an hour plus tips. That's all. Most of them could not even qualify for COVID release because they did not make a base pay. We've not raised the minimum wage for 13 years. And it took black folk from 400 years to get to 725 because slavery was zero. 
For every one dollar per hour that wages rise among workers in the bottom 60% of earning, spending on government assistance falls by roughly $5.2 billion. So if you want to end things like food stamps, don't just snatch it away from people by while they're hungry. Pay people a living wage and that will automatically go down. The porch is full of misery. The fact of the matter is, Pastor, we've had a silent depression that has caught up with us, one writer says. More than a decade ago, a political economist from the University of Maryland said, what we are really beginning to experience is a process of slow decay punctuated by reoccurring economic crisis, one in which reforms only achieve sporadic gains up and down, but the long-term trends of growing inequality, economic dislocation, failing democratic accountability, deepening poverty, ecological degradation, greater invasions of liberty, and growing imprisonment, especially among minorities, continues to slowly and quietly challenge the belief in the minds of many people that our systems even have the moral integrity and capacity to fix things. I have no one to throw me in the water. MIT professor Otto Swammer said, there's a blind spot in America's economic theory, it's called consciousness. Our refusal to have an economic theory that looks and sees that we are all integrated. We all really do need one another. We all really do need one another. And then the other thing that is hurting us is in the midst of this, we keep hearing the calls for two things that will not help us. Normalcy and compromise. Saving this democracy cannot be a matter of compromise. Getting back to normal is not where we want to get back to. Normal is what got us where we are. Fundamental human rights cannot be compromised. Voting rights cannot be compromised. A basic living wage cannot be compromised. The fact is that there's not a county in this country where a person working at minimum wage can afford a basic two-bedroom apartment. Giving people a living wage that was asked for at the March on Washington when the agenda of the March on Washington was a $2 minimum wage with indexed by inflation would be $15 today. Historic compromise is what's got us in trouble, y'all. In the first place, we compromised with slavery and it lasted 250 years. We compromised the humanity of black people and called them three-fifths of a person. Too much of the church compromised. There was a civil war in the church before there was a civil war in the nation. The church split Northern Methodist, Southern Methodist, Northern Baptist before there was ever and in the 1840s. We compromised early on saying women didn't have the right to vote, couldn't hold office. Did you know that in 1935 when Roosevelt passed the Social Security Act, but in order to get it passed, he had to compromise with some folk who said, look, we'll only go along with it if you make sure women and black and brown folks can't pay in the system. Yeah, it was a compromise. We don't want our women to get too uppity, and we don't want black and brown folk to be equal. And so they compromised. And it wasn't until 1954 that people in the agrarian culture, agriculture culture, and the domestic culture could even pay in the social security. How many of y'all know that history? I see some of you nodding. We compromised. And because of that compromise, 50% of even white women couldn't pay into social security early on and almost no black or brown people. This is not the time in America for peaceful negligence and compromise and going back to normal. It's time to expose and divide and, 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 and make sure people understand the lies and the myths that have kept America from addressing the needs of all her people. Maybe we need to expose the lie that we don't have the money to, to do this. We have the money to do this. We do not have a problem with scarcity in America of money. We've got a problem with the scarcity of will and compassion and mercy and justice. I can tell you where the money is. The money is tied up in greedy corporate in, uh, interests and a bloated military budget. 
Well, we spend 54 cents of every discretionary dollar into the war economy and less than 15 cents on things like education and health care. We do not need genteel politics which cover up gross inequality. We need respect, yes, but not respect on the outside for the cameras while the fundamental disrespect and deliberate policy oppression happens behind the cameras and in the back rooms and in the boardroom. Yes, the Economic Policy Institute says that if America doesn't address what's happening with visionary and social economic policy, the health and well-being, the soul of the nation is stake. This is a, these are economists saying this. If poor and low-income people don't vote and their allies and determine who's in office and policymakers don't change course from one-shot policy activism, and if we don't face all of these things simultaneously, we will face an even greater economic pearl. What we need is long-term economic and social justice policy that establishes justice, promotes the general welfare, and rejects decades of austerity and builds strong social programs that lift society from the bottom. Because if you lift from the bottom, everybody rises. We know what to do. We must vote with our prayers. We must vote with our sermons. We must vote with our protest. And we must vote with our ballots. We know what to do and why we must do it. And maybe God has fixed it so that the oppression has created so much poverty and so many folk with low wealth at, that it has also, in the midst of the misery, produced a powerful voting bloc. Maybe there's so much pain now that it has actually produced a powerful voting bloc for poor white folk and poor black folk and poor Latino folk and poor brown folk. And I'm not talking about folk that are on the street, living on the street. I'm talking about people, a family of four that makes under $50,000 a year. Y'all know that's low wealth in this country, according to the, the economists. But maybe sometimes Pharaoh goes too far. Maybe sometimes Pharaoh oppresses folks so long until they grow. Maybe sometimes the porch gets so many people on it that something's got to be done. Yeah. And so here we are today, and there are 168 million voters who cast a ballot in the last general election. But guess this as I prepare to go to my seat. 58 million were low-income voters. That's 35% of the voting population. In battleground states, according to a study we did called Waking the Sleeping Giants, in battleground states where the, where the margin of victory was only 3%, poor and low wealth people make up 45% of the electorate. Hmm. And 30% in all the other states. This cuts against the common misinterpretation that poor and low-income people don't have enough power and are apathetic about politics and inconsequential to electoral columns. And fact of the matter is, the truth is, as I move around the country, poor and low-wealth people, along with people of faith and labor and other people of moral consciousness, we are the stone that the builders rejected, that have now become the chief cornerstone and can and rebuild this thing called America. We know what we must do. We must tell the truth. We might, we can't shut this stuff down with just a prayer. We got to tell the truth and we've got to take tenacious action. Look at your neighbor COVID safe and say tenacious action. We can't stay locked in the sanctuary. We can't just preach behind the podium. Yes, we must, but we can't do it only here. No, we got to preach in the public square. We must engage justice and love with a tenacity born of the Holy Spirit. We must use every nonviolent tactic to say we won't stay in this pool of misery. And we have to refuse to go backwards anymore. That's what Jesus taught. That's what Paul, by the Holy Spirit, said. Justice, loving tenacity, telling the truth, 
We must stand up in our misery and the misery of this nation and say no more. We must stand up and declare that we are not going backwards and we are not standing still. We are facing a committed form of regression and meanness and, and bullying, political bullying. They're using 21st century tactics steeped in the tactics of the past. They've been used before. We're seeing things that are funded by wealthy oligarchs that use division to elect candidates that will embrace the false notions of trickle-down economic and neoliberalism. But, but there is a power. Uh, even now and then the Bible talks about the power. That power that's, that brought those bones down in the valley of dry bones. If they ever get together, that power that's found in the upper room in Acts. And so we've got to take a vote of conscience for change. Tell your neighbor, say neighbor, voting is not only something we must do, it's something we must see as sacred. We've got to do it for change. Because the truth of the matter is, America didn't give you your right to vote. Voting is not a democratic right. Voting is a God right and a God virtue. What you talking about, Baba? The Bible says in the first book of the Bible that God gave them the right to choose. That's voting, y'all. That's what separates us from the animals. The ability to make a choice. And in Hebrew, the word for vote is koil, K-O-L. And the word for voice is koil, K-O-L. Whenever the Bible says, and the voice of God spoke, it literally means the voice and the vote of God spoke. And whenever it says the prophet spoke with their mouth, it means the prophets voted with their mouth. And so we've got to understand the same thing that Jesus was saying to the man at the pool. You have a vote. You don't have to stay here. The same thing the Holy Spirit said to the church in Hebrew. You can decide whether you go backwards or whether you resist going backwards. You have a vote. And it's all through the Bible that we have a vote. God told Moses, don't cry into me. You've got a rod. Cast it. Esther, you can make a decision. Go see the king. Amos, you can organize a remnant until justice rolls down like water, gentle righteousness like a mighty stream. Joshua, you got to vote. You can walk around the city until the walls come down. Ezekiel, you got to vote. Go preach to the bones in the valley. Disciples, you got to vote. Come follow me. Deny yourself and follow me. Woman with an issue of blood, you got to vote. If I can just touch the hem of his garment. Howard Thurman said that in every generation, we got to decide who we stand with. Fannie Lou Hamer said, I got to vote this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. We must vote against injustice and vote against inequality and vote against meanness and vote against hatred. We must say no. We must understand that every problem we see out here is a problem of policy. Isaiah 10 said, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their right and make women and children their prey. Jurgen Moltmann said, you want to know what faith and hope looks like? He said, faith is whenever it develops into hope, causes not rest, but unrest. Not patience, but impatience. Real hope does not claim the unquieted heart, but real hope is the unquieted heart in humanity. Those who hope in Christ decide they can no longer put up with the reality that's anti-Christ and they decide to suffer under it in order to change it do y'all hear what I'm saying in this moment we've got to be a part of help making America face this question what myth makes you vote for somebody who claims to be Christian and then creates policy to take your health care and do everything unchristian what myth makes people hate mercy and block mercy and block grace? What myth makes you vote against health care and then claim to be a Christian when when I look, Jesus healed the lepers and never charged them a copay? 
What myth makes a few people think that care more about packing the Supreme Court with one person than keeping people out of caskets during COVID? What myth makes somebody think that taking money from public education is going to help your child? What myth makes people think bad police that kill innocent black men, women, brown women makes you safer? What myth makes some fight the things that would help preserve the kind of mercy and help we need on in, in other words, I could go on, but the point is we can't shrink back, y'all. We've got to make this nation face the question that we've got to decide America, death is no longer an option. Racism is no longer an option. Injustice is no longer an option. Staying where we are is no longer an option. Do I have a witness? Do I have a witness? We've got to unleash the power that we have. Faith without works is dead. But faith with works is power. We gotta go down to the king's house. There comes a time that we got to stand up. We got to demand. We got to move. We got to know the power that we have. And I want to close right here. I remember when the movie Amistad came out. And Amistad in the movie, you know about SinQ, who led the revolt against on the ship. When John Quincy Adam said to SinQ, I don't know what we're going to do. But SinQ said, we won't be going in there alone tomorrow. And John Quincy Adams said, alone? Indeed not. We have right on our side. But then Sinku said, no, I'm not talking about right on our side. I'm talking about the ancestors are on our side. Don't play right there. I'm talking about ancestors on our side. There's a great cloud of witnesses that are on our side. And what they're saying is if we won more with less, surely you all can win more with more. If Harriet Tubman didn't have email, didn't have Twitter, didn't have Instagram, she didn't have a car, she didn't have any of that, but she got 700 people out of slavery. All she had was moss on the north side of the tree and a north star in the sky. Now she did have a pistol because she said, you gonna be free one way or the other, but you're not going back. And on this Sunday, before All Saints Sunday, I wanna say the saints are with us. Don't forget what they've done. Don't let their living be in vain. Don't let their dying be in vain. We are not alone. Whatever we've got to do until sick folk are healed, let's vote. Until low-wage workers are organized and paid, let's vote. Until affordable housing is real, let's vote. Until voting rights are expanded and protected, let's vote. Until saving the world is more important than blowing up the world, let's vote. Somebody say, let's vote. If we gotta march, march. If we gotta stand, stand. But as long as God is God, let's vote. As long as any politician's policies that are hurting God's people need to be challenged, let's vote. Let's decide we won't be silent anymore. As long as God says, let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream, let's vote. Tell your neighbor, let's vote. As long as God is greater than any Caesar and greater than any puppet, let's vote. As long as God wants a world where everybody's in and nobody's out, let's vote and vote your faith. You know how to vote your faith, don't you? The hymn writer said, Satan is busy stirring up wrath, gathering stones to block my path. My enemies inflicting all the hurt they can by throwing their rocks and hiding their hands. But you dig one ditch, you better dig two. Because the trap you set for me might just be for you. God put it in my heart and you can't take it away. My soul's on fire and your word can't harm me because I'm going to work in, I'm toiling, I'm hoping, I'm praying, I'm waiting, I'm watching, I'm fasting, I'm believing, and I won't let go of my faith. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm holding on 
to my faith. You can't stop me. Racism can't stop me. Racism can't break me. Evil can't stop me. I'm holding on to my faith. With God on my side, I'm holding on to my faith. I wish I had a church here that would say as long as God is God, face the giants. As long as God is God, face the Red Sea. As long as God is God, come out of your pool of misery. As long as God is God, refuse to go backwards. Look at your neighbor. Keep your mask on and tell them there's no mountain that we can't climb. There's no valley that we can't cross. There's no enemy that can't be defeated. There's no darkness that can't be overcome. There's no pressure that can't be pushed through. There's no political power that can't be overturned. There's no challenge that can't be survived. There's no war of the spirit that can't be subdued. You know what to do. Now let's do it. Working, toiling, hoping, praying, waiting, watching, believing, declaring, voting, hold, 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 onto your faith. Say yeah, say yeah, say yeah. Touch your neighbor with a COVID high five and say yes, I'm holding, I'm holding, I'm voting, I'm standing, I'm believing in my faith. Say yeah, say yeah, say yeah. And the people of God said, Amen. Can we give God glory? Bishop William Dave Barber the second. Come on, Pascal, let's praise God one more time for the man of God. Tell the truth. Turn on your tenacity and take action. Bishop, we thank you. We thank you for that call from God. We know what we've got to do. So now let's go and do it. When? Oh, come on. When? Now. God, we thank you. We thank you that we have heard from heaven today. We thank you for this man of God. You have set this season for such a time as this. We thank you for his message. But even more than that, we thank you for his ministry, for his walk. We pray, oh God, that you would fill him back up as he has poured out unto us. Let we, oh God, who are in this place, and those who are watching even around the world, let us know that we have heard from you today and let us take action now. We love you. In the powerful and precious name of Jesus, who is the Christ. And all who love the Lord said amen and amen. Family, this day, this day God is calling someone. Says, Pastor, I need to unite with a church, a fellowship of believers who follow this revolutionary activist for justice named Jesus. Who came, who lived, who died, who rose, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Today, if that's you, we want to invite you to know Christ as your Savior. So from wherever you are, if you are here in person, if you're watching online, we invite you to go to our site, our website, and join our family. Someone will be in contact with you within 24 hours. We want you to know that we are serious about this being your place to find your belonging and your community. Family, we have been blessed from glory today, and we know... We know when the word of God goes forth, there's always a blessing in store. I hope that we don't leave this place 
unaware of what our moral responsibility is in this season we're not going to stay at the pool no we're going to rise up and we're going to do justice love mercy walk humbly with our god and do exactly what god has called us to do i'm going to invite our acolytes to come as we prepare our hearts to leave this place can we praise god for our praise team blessing us today thank you all so much We're going to go ahead and get Bishop down. Bishop, we're going to. And as our pastors come. And now may the Lord bless you and keep his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May our God lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may you continue to live for God. May you love God. May you follow God. And in all things, may you continue to stay the course. We pray these things in Jesus name and the people of God said amen and amen. Let's praise God one more time as we leave this place.